If you believe some AI watches, we are racing towards the singularity. Uh, and this is the point at which AI outstrips human intelligence. Dion, you'll uh, tell us if that's right in a moment. Bege and it begins to improve itself and uh, at an exponential rate. And when that happens, well, then what will become of us? So in the last few years, some people like Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Bill Gates have warned about the possible dangers of AI. So what are the dangers? How will AI affect the least among us? And what about the people in the church who follow Jesus' example, who are deeply concerned about the homeless, the hungry, uh, and the people in the global south that are faced with a multitude of challenges such as debt, slavery, hunger, and environmental destruction? Okay, to help us explore some of these questions on AI, we have with us Professor Dion Foster. Dion is a member of the Faculty of the Theology of Stellenbosch. Dion holds two PhDs, one in Theology and Neuroscience, Consciousness, Identity, Strong Artificial Intelligence, and African Theology. Dion's second PhD is in Biblical Ethics. Dion, uh, you are the director of the Bayes Nubia Center for Public Theology in Cape Town. You are the editor for the Epworth Review. You're a member of the Oxford Institute for Methodist Theological Studies. And you sit on the editorial board of the Cambridge University Journal, Holiness. Dion, welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Help us understand something about AI. Tell us what AI is briefly and easy to understand. Yeah, so Kevin, thanks so much for, uh, for having me on the vlog today. And uh, it's, it's a great joy to be speaking to you. Yeah, artificial intelligence is um, basically the, the concept where uh, machines begin to move from mere knowledge processing, information processing, uh, towards dealing with aspects of intelligence that that can either aid humanity or surpass the way in which uh, humans deal with with concepts like uh, information and you know figuring out complex problems and uh, and the like. So artificial intelligence is intended really uh, to aid us in our own computational ability in relation to the world. And so, should we be worried? Um, Kevin, I think like all things in the world, um, any technology that gets developed has both the opportunity to, to, to help us and the, the opportunity to harm us. It depends in large measure uh, what our relationship is to the technologies that we develop and artificial intelligence uh, amongst them. And uh, also how, how critically we regard uh, what we do with these uh, technologies. So I, I think like, like all professors, my answer to the question is yes and no. I mean, there are very clearly some things about which we should be worried. Um, and there's some things about which uh, I, I think, you know, artificial intelligence really is uh, helping us in very, very significant ways. What are, what are your, some of your main concerns about AI? So, um, Kevin, I mean, one of my uh, major concerns with regards to artificial intelligence uh, actually relates to the topic that we are talking about today, with, which is how artificial intelligence will affect uh, the world's poorest citizens. So one of the main uses for artificial intelligence currently is um, using intelligent code uh, to aggregate markets. So in, in days gone by, you had uh, traders who would uh, work on the markets and they would be the ones who would decide when one should buy a particular stock or sell it, what one should trade, what levels are right to trade. Um, and, and those markets have now become so complex that even teams of people cannot keep up uh, with the rapid changes that are taking place globally and uh, with how quickly uh, markets fluctuate and change. So what we've seen is artificially intelligent uh, machines, particularly uh, computers, which are programmed to pick up on these very subtle uh, momentary fluctuations in the market. But also because they are machines, they can also have access to this wealth of historical data. So they know if a market drops by 2% after a particular series of events, you know, some global crisis, then it's not worth selling because it will bounce back. They've got that kind of historical uh, data. Now, those kinds of things tend to work well when, when they work well. But um, what we have seen uh, more recently is that uh, persons whose only intention is profit will find ways to manipulate those systems so that uh, they can make the greatest amount 
of, of value, for example, on their transactions and sometimes even shorting markets so that uh, others will lose out. Now, obviously, we can see in, in those kinds of conditions, the, the, there, are, there are two problems with it. First of all, um, these codes which are put in, the, 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 the coding of, of these artificially intelligent uh, programs that work on the markets can self-aggregate their codes. So they learn as they go along. And uh, we're getting to the stage now where those uh, programs are so sophisticated that even the most intelligent, uh, well-trained, historically knowledgeable um, uh, uh, persons are not able to understand exactly what's happening. So in some senses, we're giving over our agency, economic agency, to machines who are deciding who gets wealth, who doesn't get wealth. But of course, also in relation to that, we, we, we I think, could question um, whether this isn't also an expression of, of economic inequality. Um, obviously, those who have access to more powerful machines can pay very uh, highly trained coders a lot more money, have an edge over those who don't. Um, so what we see is that those who have money make more money and that those who don't have access to those kinds of resources again lose out, not only economically, but also technologically. So what are you saying is that AI is actually potentially going to exacerbate the difference between the rich and the poor, not actually make it better? I think again it comes down to uh, you know to to who is is making use of artificially intelligent technologies. If your only aim is profit at all costs, then of course you're going to develop the kind of codes that put profit above all else. Um, however, if there were more benevolent reasons for using uh, an artificially intelligent uh, program, and one was looking, for example, to to limit losses in the markets for poorer economies, then it has the possibility actually of doing good, because those codes can be programmed to operate in different ways. So I think it comes down again to to the sort of ethics of the use of artificial intelligence rather than artificial intelligence itself. We, we, we can see one of the, the, the big cases uh, which has been playing out in the news recently um, over the last uh, two or three years is how uh, these bots, self-programmed bots, um, work on social media. So Cambridge Analytica was probably the most prominent of those and uh, how very intelligent people developed very intelligent machines that were then able to aggregate their code based on news cycles and the kind of feedback that they got from users. So what users liked, what they disliked, um, what kind of language was used in commenting on posts and uh, these bots would then go in and post uh, you know, uh, stories that, that were often written by human beings, sometimes not even, um, and then use those to, to sort of get people to, to, to operate in terms of fear, uh, to, to evoke their worst prejudices. So we can see that, that um, you know, th there is a sense in which artificial intelligence um, can be something which is incredibly powerful, not only in terms of physical structures, but also in terms of, of, of ethical and social structures. Um, Kevin, just for those who are watching the blog, um, I, I would like to encourage uh, folks, if, if they're looking for something interesting to read, uh, to read uh, two books by uh, a, an Israeli um, historian, a guy called Yuval Harari. Um, he wrote two books. The first one is called Sapiens, which is a very interesting book and it speaks about the fact that we, we very often structure our lives, our societies, our choices uh, around what he would call myth, uh, things that we aspire for, hope for uh, and believe in. But the second book, which is called Homo Deus, is even more insightful uh, when it comes to the use of technology to achieve what we, what we believe to be the good life. Now, of course, that particular statement, the good life, has become so um, so twisted, so, so broken in contemporary society where we've come to associate the good life only with economic gain, with political prominence, uh, you know, with one-upmanship on others. And, and Harari speaks about how technology often is employed, like with Cambridge Analytica, uh, to achieve very nefarious ends uh, in this world. So, so there's a lovely irony here, Dion. So artificial intelligence was used to put possibly the most unintelligent president <laughs> yeah. into power. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you think about it, you know, the the if you look at at uh, Bloom's taxonomy, you know, of of how we move from just mere information to knowledge and wisdom. One of the things that that we cannot claim is that there's a lot of artificial wisdom, you know. So I think there's another step beyond intelligence, which which is often the step in which you know people like tend to to try and operate, which is is the question of asking not just what is the technology and what does it do, but how could it be employed wisely? How could it be used for the greater good? Because Kevin, I think that's one of the things which is important. Um, when you and I initially discussed this, uh, the idea for this talk, um, one of the things that I said to you is that. We have to be careful that we don't uh, engage in overly simplistic or binary thinking. The reality is that we cannot do without technology. I mean, most of us have already given our lives over to technologies that we don't fully understand and that in some ways do make our lives better. You know, if we think about international banking, uh, the fact that I'm sitting in, in Stellenbosch in South Africa and you're in the UK, um, I mean, that we can communicate with, with one another in these ways, you know. I, I don't understand where exactly the image goes and how it gets processed. Um, I don't understand where my money is in the bank, but it's, it's very convenient for me to put a card into a machine and withdraw it. Uh, I don't understand who operates the traffic lights in my city so that I can get safely to work or from work. So there's a sense in which we have to acknowledge that we've already given ourselves over to very in intelligent machine processes. Um, and it's not necessarily that those processes are all nefarious. They're ambivalent in a sense. Uh, they could be either good or bad. And, and, and I think that's the thing we have to hold on to. We, we've just had the hottest day uh, in, in, in history here in London yesterday. We, in fact, you may hear the rain in the background. There's, we're having a thunderstorm at the moment. Remember, this <laughs> is the UK. <laughs> Siberia, the tundra is burning. In the US, there's both flooding, droughts, and fire. Bangladesh is drowning, while Africa and Australia uh, both are slowly dying of thirst. You, in one of your early papers on Tyre de Chardin's evolutionary cosmology, you suggested that humanity might have to become extinct for the salvation of the cosmos. And I'm just wondering whether what you meant by that statement, and in retrospect, if you thought that you were actually being quite prophetic. <laughs> Goodness. So, Kevin, the one thing that I can say was that that was a very controversial paper um, at the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 in some senses, so, so, so let me unpack uh, two things that I think are important. The first one, I think, is for us as Christians, we've, We've fallen into a, a, an anthropocentric view of contemporary theology. Somehow we've displaced God and God's will and God's intention, and we've placed ourselves at the center of creation. If you look at much of contemporary Christianity, uh, particularly evangelical uh, Christianities, we see that, that the very center of what is proposed there is the salvation of the human person. Uh, rather than the kingdom of God, or the grace and justice of God's rule in all of creation, we, we somehow have thought that God's primary intention for all of history is to save human beings, as if non-human creation matters less to God, as if God cares less about animals and trees and seas and, and rivers and, and the soil. Um, we somehow think, you know, that we are exceptional, that, that we are the exception uh, for God's love. Now, this doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, but we do have to recognize that at the very center of all good theology is God. I mean, all good theology is ultimately about saying, what can we know about the character, nature, will, and intention of the God in whom we believe and, and whom we love? And when we begin to place God once again at the center of our theology rather than ourselves, it changes the way in which we think about salvation. Then salvation is no longer just human salvation, but it could be planetary as well. And, and in that particular uh, cosmology, when, when we think about the fact that, that perhaps we could be one of the reasons that hinders salvation on the planet, then it might not be that far-fetched to think that we might be a sin that needs to be dealt with. Now, there are obviously different ways to deal with sin. One of those ways is, is, is repentance, is for us to recognize as humanity that we are not good stewards of uh, the planet, that we are the cause 
Um, the Anthropocene is the cause of so much of, of the environmental destruction, of the suffering of other species, particularly animals, uh, and that we need to repent of those actions and find ways to, to change our behavior. The other way, of course, is to recognize that we may in fact destroy ourselves. That may not be God's will for us. Our extinction may not be God's will, but it may be the telos, the end point of how we're living. Um, and that doesn't mean that it would then be the end of creation. A loving God who loves creation may still then be able to say, well, uh, if humanity does unfortunately continue to live in sin and destroy itself, uh, at least uh, they may be able, I may be able to save the rest of creation, the rest of the planet. John, thank you very much. Um, I think um, uh, you, you have really helped us to understand something about AI. I think I'm less concerned now about the, uh, about the, the Terminator arriving on our doorstep. <laughs> so, um, but but um, I, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to chat to us. Yeah, only patient. a pleasure, Kevin, and, and uh, thanks, thanks for your ministry and the opportunity to, to participate in this.